Thank you everyone for joining us today. We've got Abba Shapiro as your presenter. He's going to be talking about Luminar 3, mixing it up. So he's going to show you how to use the blend modes using looks and layers. So this is going to be a really interesting, fun, and fast-paced presentation. Abba, thank you so much for presenting, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Lori, and thanks again, everybody, also for joining us. Uh, we're doing, as Lori said, uh, some more advanced techniques. I'm going to try to still step into it from some basics, so if you are new to Luminar, uh, you won't get lost. But sometimes when we do the overviews, we don't get to go deeper and use some of the really cool abilities that uh, Luminar has, and that's worth working with layers and with working with blending modes and masking. And there's a lot of fun things you can do with that. So that's the intent of this webinar. I'll be taking some images such as we have this one here. This is a before image. Let me scroll down. Uh, just shot in Hawaii. And I'm going to process this and use some blending modes to actually focus my detail on just the lighter areas without, you know, bringing back some of the detail without losing a lot of the detail in the shadowed areas. We recently did a quick tip video on blending an image together. I had this image from New York City of, of a runner, and I'm going to add a moon to that. So if you didn't see the quick tip, I'm going to walk through that. And I wanted to do that even though we have that as a quick tip because there were a lot of people that did have some questions. And that's one of the great things about the live webinars is that as we go through, uh, people can ask questions and I can you know, give you the answers if I have the answers or find the answers on things they may be able to do to enhance their images. So those are a couple of things we'll be working with. And I want to start off with just something very basic, and that's how I would process an image and take advantage of the looks. And I like to use layers when I do that. So let me just go ahead and open this image. And this image is is pretty well composed. There's not a lot that I would do with it out of the, the box. I would be happy to show folks this. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to edit this. I'm going to switch over to the edit panel. And I'm going to just jump straight to that quick and awesome workspace. We have a variety of workspaces here, but I'm going to start with quick and awesome. It has most of the things that I'd like. And I'll very quickly just use the Accent AI filter. And this is going to really just help the image pop, open up some of the shadows, recover some of the highlights. I'll add a little bit of Sky Enhancer to this image, maybe play with the saturation and vibrance. And what I'm doing here is just developing the image, not in any creative way. I'm not trying to stylize it now. I'm just trying to process this image so it looks neutral. A lot of times you'll take an image. I'm going to go ahead and add the develop filter. And you just you know want to change the exposure a little bit just so the picture is neutral. And that's the key thing here when working with layers. Uh, I take my first layer and I just do basic developing. If it was too dark or too light or recover some highlights or shadows, you know, I definitely love our um, artificial intelligent filters, the Accent AI and the Sky Enhancers and some of the other filters like foliage. But I just take my picture so it looks good. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the Add Filter panel so you can see the entire image. And this is what I brought in, and it's not that much difference, but it's processed. And now I'm creating a second layer and on that second layer is when I can start stylizing an image or applying looks. Because one of the things is, is if you're working on a single layer, and I'm going to go ahead and do this, and you'll see it will, if I add a look, the way looks work is they add all the filters to create that look and remove the filters that are there. So if I threw in warm sunset, I would lose all of the processing I might have done for this image. So I don't want to do that. I can undo that very easily with Control Z, Command Z, Control Z, Command Z. Uh, I can also go look at my history and step back to everything I did. So I'm going to go back to the point where I properly expose this image. Okay. And, and maybe I'm going to add a little bit of, I think, sharpening, a little bit of detail. Uh, I would like to do that. So a filter, and I like throwing in new filters on different webinars 
to uh, show you some of their benefits. The detail enhancer filter, a lot of people don't uh, go to, but it's a really powerful filter in that it allows me to add detail to my small, medium, and large pixel areas. So I don't wanna really sharpen the sky, but it'd be great to get some detail in this lighthouse. So I can use the small detail enhancer and you start seeing it's really bringing out some of this crispness. And then I'm going to take the large and actually soften that so that my sky is not affected. And I think I even pushed this a little bit hard. I was mostly talking and moving the slider without looking at the image. But just a little bit of enhancement here just to give it that edge. And this is a JPEG. So this is like uh, I might have even shot this uh, out of my phone. I'm not sure. So I have this properly processed. And now I'm ready to play. And I would call this a global correction. And then I will go to my layers uh, part of the interface. And there's a little plus sign. I'll click on that. And I'm going to add a new adjustment layer. And the advantage of now adding a new adjustment layer is I can play with any of the looks or any of the filters I want. And I won't lose all of the work that I did to do a neutral development of this image. So I could say, what does the black and white landscape look like? Well, that's kind of interesting. I could go ahead and try the different filters here, the different light filters. And as you can see, uh, if it's black and white, as I've said this before, it's not just desaturation, it's how we look at the tonality of uh, the grayscale. And as I click on each of these, I get a very different look. As a matter of fact, take a look. If I put the blue filter in front, it dramatically changes the feel of this image. And I can use this as a starting point, or I can go ahead and start playing with some of these sliders for how much of each of these colors are going to affect my image. So I could do that. If I wanted to, I could play with another filter. But here's a great little trick. I kind of like this. I may want to come back to this. So instead of just replacing it by clicking on another one of these looks, I'm going to go up here and actually turn off this adjustment layer. I'm going to just click the little eyeball. And now I'm back to looking at my neutral image. But I know that whenever I want to get back to that black and white image, all I have to do is turn it on. And as a matter of fact, I can right click on this and I can rename that because I don't want to remember it as adjustment layer one. I might want to remember that as my black and white style. Okay. And let me go ahead and spell style right. I was one key over black and white style. And you notice it's not turned on. I can activate it. And there it is. But I'm going to keep that off and I'm going to add another layer, another adjustment layer. And let me run out of landscape. And I could look at one of these other styles that we downloaded. Uh, we have a bunch that come when you install the application. There's a whole bunch of other ones that Lori will point you to on our website that you can download a lot of free looks. And the tonality ones are absolutely wonderful, as well as some of these portrait looks. But I'm going to use one of the ones that come with the application when you install it. So I'll click on dramatic because I want something more dramatic in this. And you'll notice that all my looks down here change. And I can simply step through these and try these different looks on my image. There's another black and white film noir. I kind of like that. That's, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I want to save that. And if I did, all I have to do is turn that off and go up and add another adjustment layer and I can try another feel. And I can either use a preset that I can go here and get this dramatic look, or if I wanted to, I can go ahead and undo that. And instead of applying a look to this layer, I can start using individual filters. So maybe I want this to have a nice kind of soft glow and maybe a little bit more of a sunset feel. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to add golden hour. I'll click on that. And so this will give me a little bit of that golden sunset. We'll see if we can try to fake this. We still have a very blue sky. Um, so it may or may not work. And then I want to maybe add some other enhancements. I'm going to go to the foliage enhancer. And that allows me to go ahead and turn this really green trees to something more autumny. I'm going to go ahead and change the hue of that, bring that down and focus that, and I can easily toggle that on and off. So I'm isolating that here, and I'm getting kind of a pretty cool feel to this image, and maybe I wanna age it a little bit, 
And one of the things that I use on people a lot, but sometimes, you know, using a filter in a different instance. So the Orton effect, which is one of our creative filters that a lot of people like to use on uh, portraits, I'm going to try it on here and see how it affects my image. And I'm just playing. And the luxury of being able to work with layers is I'm not messing up these two other options that I have. And I, I kind of like that. It's giving me a more painterly feel. I think I want to pull my saturation down a little bit, uh, play with the contrast. And this is the thing that I really recommend to folks is never be afraid to just grab a slider and swing it all the way to the extreme because then you can get a good sense of what that slider does. And then it's easy enough to bring it back. And that's one of the best ways to learn how to use the different sliders. And this is giving me a kind of an interesting vibe. I like that it's very soft. This is my before and this is my after. And it, it's a great little feel. I think my green is a little bit too green still. And I'm gonna show one of the filters that a lot of folks don't use. It's the HSL filter. It's one of my favorites. It stands for hue, saturation, and luminance. And what it allows me to do is control specific colors and how saturated they are. Or I can tweak their hue. So I can change it from maybe a green to a, a yellow. And I can also say, oh, this color needs to be brighter. So for instance, the green is bothering me in this image. So I'm going to bring the saturation down a little bit. And you notice it's only affecting the green part of my image. And I could go over to hue. And again, with green, I could move it more towards the yellow to give me a slightly different feel. So this slide is very powerful. And I think my blue is, is a little bit distracting. I, I really want a much more muted blue. And I can go back to saturation bring down my blue and my aqua a little bit, tones down the sky, tones down the water, and I can even grab the luminance of the blue and the aqua and bring that down. And now I'm getting kind of a, a, a more, you know, we just went from a bright sunny day to this looks like a kind of a stormy winter effect. I'm, I've dramatically changed this image and I haven't lost anything. There's my original, there's this style, and I can export out this as an individual image and then turn this off and go ahead and turn on my black and white there. I can turn that off and try this black and white. So I have those two different feelings all with the same image in my library by just turning on and off adjustment layers. So this is, you know, a very, you know, this is a basic way that you can control things, but it's very, very powerful. Now, some of you might be asking, well, what if I turned on a couple of layers? And that's something else you can do. And that's where you can really start creating something new and different. So I'm going to turn off this black and white, turn this one on. I really like the feel of it. And then I can turn on this adjustment layer. And now I'm blending the two of these together. And I have a third look. So I can easily mix and match and get some really creative looks. But remember, with adjustment layers, I can control their opacity. So if I wanted to, I could go to this black and white layer, and I'm going to bring down its opacity and let the original layer blend through a little bit. So I'm just softening the effect. And now I can go ahead to the upper layer, which I've stylized, and turn that on. And I've tweaked this even a little bit more. So when you've created layers, feel free to turn them on and off in combination and work with the blending. The other thing you can do is you can also change the order of your layers. So for instance, you know, there's a big difference when I apply the black and white before I apply all these color effects. Well, I can grab that adjustment layer two, and I'm gonna turn this off just so you can see what I'm doing. I'm grabbing adjustment layer two, and I'm dragging it directly above my original. So I'm still getting that same effect because these two are turned off, but now I can go ahead and turn on one of these. And we'll go ahead and click on that and turn on this black and white. Now this black and white is affecting the color modification. I did an adjustment layer two to the neutral image. And I can then again grab the opacity maybe of the black and white and let a little bit of color bleed through. And I get, again, a very different image. So being able to move your adjustment layers around and blend them together with opacity 
gives you a lot of power and control. Now, while we're working on complete adjustment layers, I'm going to bring that up to 100%. If you right click or control click, if you don't have a two button mouse, there is an option here called blending. And depending on which word you hover over, it applies blending modes. And you might see this in other applications. I know some folks here uh, work in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom or other applications. And blending modes is a standard thing that we use in photo processing. But what I really like about the blending modes in Luminar is I don't have to select them. I don't have to commit to them until I like them. I can just hover my mouse over them and get different effects of it blending that black and white layer with the layers below. And what these blending modes really are doing is it's math without you having to know the math. And you could look it up in, in, in a book and it might say, oh, I'm taking all the grayscale that's below 50% and doubling that and I'm ignoring anything above it or removing the darker areas but doubling the brighter areas. That's really what it's doing mathematically, but you don't have to know that. You just know what you like and you can just hover over and, you know, this has a whole different vibe with the lighten blend mode versus an overlay blend mode. So I could go ahead and do that and now yet another look that I can start tweaking. So I have this great blend mode and in addition to a blend mode, I can go back and start working with opacity. So I'm creating a variety of different images, all based upon that very first image that I developed. So this is great. And I could go in and then tweak this at a new adjustment layer. These are all what I would call global adjustments. They're affecting the whole image, but I could add yet another layer here. And I want to make sure this layer is on top, even though I have this one turned off. And one of the things that's bothering me a little bit is I think my, my lighter areas are a little bit blown out. So I'm going to add a filter, and there's a variety of them that I can use to bring down my highlights. One of the ones I like to use is at the very top of the filter list. It's one of your essential filters, and it's the tone filter. And I'm going to add this. And you can see here with the tone, I have a lot of control of working with exposure and contrast and highlights and shadows. So I could work with the highlights, but there's a great one here right in the middle that's unique to Luminar, and that is smart toning. And if I move this to the right, it's going to open up my shadows without blowing out my highlights. But I want the opposite. I'm going to move it to the left, and this is going to recover some of my highlights without really crushing my shadow. So I'm getting a little bit more detail in this building here. And if I wanted to be even more aggressive, I could go in and bring down the highlights or the exposure. I don't think there's that much detail here uh, to bring back. But what I'm doing is I'm focusing just on this building here, and I really don't care what's happening to the rest of the image because I'm ultimately going to create a mask and just paint this effect just over that building. So I'm playing with my filters, trying to do the best job I can to make this show a little more detail. Maybe I'll try structure. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. And that's the really cool thing about this is that you can try things, and if you don't like them, it's easy enough to simply hit the X button and delete it, or the eyeball, and with the eyeball selected, I can actually turn off that filter. Now remember, I'm looking exclusively at what's happening right here. I don't care that it's actually ruining the, best of the rest of my image because I'm focused on just what I want this one part of the image to look like. So I kind of like this. I like I'm getting a little more detail in there. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my brush here. And if you click on that brush, it allows me to create a mask. And what a mask does is it lets me either paint in or erase the effects of that filter or all the filters on a layer. I'm doing it on the adjustment layer because it will work with both the tone and the structure that I've adjusted here, but I do want to point out that throughout the application, each individual filter has the ability to create a mask. So I can say, oh, I just wanted to paint in structure and I don't 
and everything else, I want to affect the entire image. In this case, I want it to affect everything on the layer, both tone and structure. And I'm going to click on the brush. There is also a radial mask, which is great for creating uh, circular objects. Sometimes you may want to have a softening on the outside, not just a vignette, but maybe you'll blur the outside, but you want the inside to be sharp or vice versa. So you could do a radial mask or a gradient mask. And that lets me create a horizontal line that I can adjust. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and do that just to show you how it works. So I grab a little line here. And as you can see, I can rotate that however I want. I can also stretch this out. And that is the threshold or the softness as it goes from one area to another. And you can see that the bottom of it, this is not being affected. And the top part is being affected. And of course, I could rotate that and have it work the other way around. Not necessarily what I originally wanted to do, but it's easy enough to step back in time. I simply go to my history, and there is the structure that I added right there. So I'm stepping back in time, and I will go ahead and as if I never put that gradient on. So this is what I've done with my, actually the gradient is still there. So I'm gonna go ahead and reset that. We'll just simply fill that in. And so there it is, exactly the way I wanted it on the building. And now I'll just grab the brush. And with the brush, I can make it bigger and smaller. Up here, just grab my size. If you've worked in Photoshop or Lightroom, you can use the left and right bracket keys. Those also allow you to make the brush smaller and bigger with your keyboard. And you'll notice that there's a little red ring in the middle and a big ring on the outside. That's the softness of the brush. So the hard part is inside the red ring and everything else is soft so you can have a more gradual flow as you paint things in and out. You can easily change that again with the slider. You notice that that red ring is touching right to the edge. And again, if you like keyboard shortcuts, I pointed out left and right brackets will make this bigger and smaller. Shift left and right bracket will actually make your brush softer and harder. So I'm gonna go here, zoom in a little bit. I'm gonna hit Command plus, Control plus on Windows. And now I'm gonna just start painting. And take a look at what happens when I start painting. It's gonna only put this effect on this one area. And let me turn this on. Oh, I have it painted everywhere. I'm gonna go ahead and let's zoom back out. This is the challenge of teaching in that I, I did it with the gradient and turned it off and now I have to flip it around. So let's go ahead and clear that. There we go. And now I wanna paint this in. So this is, none of the effect is being uh, applied and I'm just gonna start painting. You can see the red shows where I'm painting, but if I turn that off, as I paint, I'm starting to apply that detail that I applied here to just the building. And I would probably zoom into 100%. You can see I'm a little bit sloppy. But the nice thing is that even if I'm a little sloppy, I can switch from paint to erase and I can erase out exactly what I want off of here. And I can make my brush more precise and smaller. Now here's a little trick and I actually have never given this tip out before. Uh, if you have the brush and you click on an edge and then go up to the upper edge and hold down the shift key, it actually paints a straight line and it's a great way to clean up an edge. So I overpaint sometimes and then I come back and I erase and I use the shift key and I just position it in the first location, move it down to the next location, hold down the shift key and click again and I get that great little straight line. I'm gonna zoom out, hit uh, command zero and just show you that all I did was affect the building. I can turn this off and turn it on again. And because I focused this, I mean, I did paint a little bit sloppy down here. I could fix that. But now if I wanted to play with my layers and my tone and my structure, I can see precisely what's being affected. And maybe I wanna bring back a little bit of the highlights, but keep that structure there. And I'm only affecting this part of my image. So I'm using a masking mode here. So I've used quite a bit of modifications, and I could probably go to this building here, grab the brush again, paint, and do the same thing I did before. And because I'm on that layer, I should be able to paint. I'm on the erase 
got to switch that to paint. I can start painting in a little bit more of the shadows here, just so it kind of doesn't seem so washed out. And realize you saw me do this, but I could very easily, you know, if you weren't looking for this, you wouldn't notice it. And one of the things you can do with painting and erasing with your masks is, I think this is a little bit too much for this building. So there is an opacity slider. I could make this opacity about 50%. Now I'm gonna erase that. And so it's gonna be slightly darker, but not as dark as it was. And if I show, go ahead and turn on that red overlay, you'll notice that this is really solid. So it's taking the advantage of all of these filters. And this one's a little more translucent, which means it's only taking a partial effect. And I can do that all with one layer. And again, with that erase button, I can go ahead and clean things up and I would probably zoom in just a little bit to fix that. But once you turn that off, you really don't notice it. So you saw me do a lot of things, but here's an important takeaway. A lot of times when you apply an existing look or you create your own look that you've saved and it looks different when you apply it to different images on that first layer. And that's because the exposure on that first layer and the contrast is probably different between different shots and different locations and different days. And if you go back to that very first layer and always bring it to just developed to a nice neutral look, then when you apply on your second adjustment layer, any kind of a look or filter, you'll get the expected results of that look and filter. And another great thing is that if I liked these and I'd labeled them properly, I could say, I really like this black and white style uh, by itself. And I, I have to kind of turn everything off to, for you to see it, but I can go ahead and click on any layer that I've created and save all the adjustments to that layer as my own personal look. So it's very easy to do. So that's just one way of blending things together. It's all one image, but I'm working on nuance here and I'm getting something very stylistic and very flexible because I can continue to turn layers on and off and add different blending modes to get different look and feel to my images. So that's the first place we're gonna start. And what I'd like to do is actually take a question now and then I'll show you some other things you can do with blending and adjustment. So Lori, is there uh, other yes. questions or a question? There, there is. Um, somebody wanted to see that again, where you do the straight line editing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I've never, okay, this is something I do, and it's like I haven't found the opportunity to teach people. So when you're doing any kind of masking, and I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, the masking to this top layer again. But so you can really see what's happening, I'm going to turn on the overlay. And just to show you, so if I went to draw a straight line, if I'm painting, I am the worst person to draw a straight. That's a straight line for me. That's that's a good day. But if I make, and all I'm doing here is clicking at that point, moving my cursor to where I want that straight like line to be, and then I hold down the shift key and click again, I get a perfectly straight line. And this is great for either drawing a nice straight line when creating a mask, or in the case of overshooting, and I'll go here to erase, I could click there with the erase, I'm holding down the shift key, and I click again, and we see it's erased. Now I do have my opacity down to 44%, so it's kind of a soft edge, but it still is a straight edge. So we can go ahead and do that one more time, click to select the starting point, hold down the shift key, click again, and you can see I now have a very straight line. And if I wanted to paint that back in, same thing, click with the mouse, hold down the shift key, click again, and I have that wonderful straight line. And that's a great little secret that I've never revealed only because I've forgotten to do it. <laughs> <laughs> great. All right, um, here's another question for you from Gordon who's asking, can you demonstrate the luminosity option again? And I think he's talking about HSL luminosity, I believe. Sure, uh, do, yeah. are just, well, there's two things with luminosity and, and, I, and I will address both of them. Okay. Uh, 
there is luminosity in the HSL filter. And I'm gonna actually jump back to my library. And uh, you'll notice, by the way, if you've been using Luminar with the latest update, they've actually changed a little icon here in the upper left-hand corner. It does the same thing. It used to be an up arrow, but now it's a little more intuitive. It actually looks like your library images. So if you click on that, it takes you right back to the gallery mode where you can see all of your media. And I'm gonna go here and open up one of these images that has a lot of red in it. And with the hue saturation slider, so I'm gonna switch from library to edit. I'm gonna add a filter and I'm gonna jump right down to HSL. If you don't wanna hunt for it, you can just type HSL in the top. Once again, it stands for hue, saturation, and luminance because you can affect the hue, saturation, and luminance values of these eight color ranges. So maybe I like this image, but the red is a little too hard. So I could literally go here and pull that back and I can desaturate the red, or if I really like it, super saturate it. I can also go in and say, you know what? Uh, I wanna deal with my yellow. The yellow is kind of cool, but what if I want that yellow to, to lean a little bit more towards an orange? So it's, it's taking the hue, in the case of the hue sliders, if you move it to the left, it turns the hue towards the color that's above it. If I move it to the right, it moves it more towards the color that's below it. So it just kind of tweaking things. And sometimes you can say, okay, that my yellows are gonna go more towards green and the greens are gonna go a little bit more towards blue. And I like what it's doing, but it's now a little bit too, uh, that uh, just bright. And so I could go back to my luminance and bring these down. And it's just bringing down anything that's yellow in my image. And I could also bring down the luminance of, of the green. So that's kind of nice. And I'm gonna throw a little trick into here. Other than controlling this, what if I only wanted it to affect this sign? Well, that's exactly where it's great that each individual filter also has the ability to have a mask. So I can click on brush. I wanna make sure that I'm painting it in and I'm just going to very, and I don't have to be as precise because I'm only dealing with the green colors, but I'm just painting and changing the color of this one area because I need that to be green and it doesn't affect any other part of my image. I'll turn this off. Let me turn off the, the uh, masking tool. And you notice I'm just affecting that one area because I used hue saturation and luminance to control the colors and just paint it in where I wanted that filter to affect this image. And that becomes very, very powerful. So that's one way that you can deal with luminance uh, within an image. And it's great if you have something that's just too bright. Sometimes you'll take a picture of something and like, you know, that red dress is just distracting and you just wanna tone it down a little bit. You don't have to go through any hoops. You just use the HSL slider and it does wonderful things. I wanna show uh, one more thing you can do. And again, this is one of those kind of confusing filters unless you get it uh, explained to you or uh, confusing masks. So we're gonna go ahead. I'm going to jump back to my gallery view. I'm specifically using the term gallery because the keyboard shortcut to get there is the letter G. So if you wanna jump back to all of your images, hit the letter G instead of going up to this button, and then you can see all of the images that are in your library or within a folder that you might have. So I wanna work with this image here. This is the before, this is the after. Uh, this is gonna be my goal. Let's see if I can get there. I did it once, we can see if I can get it again. And what's important to me is to get this detail and try to recover some sense of texture in my highlights. And that's always a challenge when shooting water because you want it to feel very tactile, but it doesn't play nicely because it's always so washed out. So the first thing I'm gonna do is a general fix of this image, just like I did before. So I'm gonna go to quick and awesome. I like to start there. Uh, sometimes I will throw in the develop filter, uh, but it, sometimes it's just easy to say, okay, Let's see what we can do, better sky, good background, saturation, vibrance. I almost do this all the time, a little clarity. Still need to open up some of this area here and I'm gonna add that toning filter that I talked about earlier and just see if Smart Tone is gonna let me open up my shadows 
which it does, and I'm getting the image to where I really like it. So this is good. Uh, I think it needs to be a little warmer, and because this is a, a little more of an advanced uh, webinar, I'm going to show you yet another one of my favorite filters, and that's the split color warmth. And what this split color warmth allows me to do is just warm up the naturally orange and yellow uh, areas of my image without affecting like my sky. So it's using a little bit of artificial intelligence and it's working with just certain bands of color and I can warm up the rocks and I can warm up the uh, just the whole feel of the image. And I can also make parts of the image less cool if I wanted to. Now remember, once I get this, if it's affecting parts of the image that I don't like the way it's affecting, and I'm going to toggle it on and off, and it's very subtle, so I actually pretty much like what it's doing. Maybe it's a little bit too much here. So what would I do? I would simply go in, grab my brush. Now I have my masking tool. Click on Erase. I'm happy with, with it being nice and soft and 100%. And I'm just painting out that split color warmth in the foreground because that was a little bit too yellow, but I still have it here in the building over here. Or the building, I guess that would be called a mountain, but it was very well built thousands and thousands of years ago. So let's go ahead and turn off the mask. And I've developed this picture to where I like it. Remember, this was my before, this was my after, and that's pretty quick. But I want to really focus on working on bringing some detail into this water. And I could simply say, well, I'm going to go ahead and add some structure and pump up the structure. But as I get the water where it's nice and crispy, this is getting a lot too sharp. It doesn't look realistic. I want this to feel just sharp and natural. So I want to be able to focus on this. But my challenge is if I started painting, I'm dealing with clouds. And it, it's really hard to be very specific to get this really bright area to control it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually delete that structure. And I'm going to create a brand new adjustment layer. And I'm going to go ahead and I will bring that structure back in. And I'm going to crank it up all the way. I want it to be very easy for me to see what's happening. I'm going to dial it back in a, in a moment. But one of the ways that you can create a mask is not just with painting with a brush, radial, or gradient, but there's something called the lum luminosity mask. And what this will do is it will create a mask based on the brightest areas of your image. And this is great in a situation like this. It's also great if you want to be able to like bring color back into a sunset, and that's the brightest part of your image, but you don't want to oversaturate the rest of the image. And if I have time, I'll dig up a sunset image to do that. So there's luminosity. I click on that. It's going to do some analysis. I think I clicked on it. Maybe I just turned it off. There we go. And it just calculated that. You can see over here, it created a mask. And if I turn on my brush to see where it created that mask, you can see that it's, you know, in the brighter areas, I have the hard red where the filter is applied. And then in the darker areas, I don't have it. And this is the very cool thing. I'm going to turn it off for just a moment. First of all, this is before and after. So it even at this point, without doing anything additional, if I toggle it on and off, uh, the sharpening doesn't look unnatural where it did before. It's a little bit aggressive here, but I could, if I was lazy, you know, just leave it this way. But I really like what it's done to the spray. So I can complement this by once again turning on my mask. I'm gonna to go to the brush, and this time I can just go to erase. And you know, if I wanted to, I could turn it on, but I'm gonna simply make sure that the areas that I don't want to be super sharp from that structure slider, I'm just erasing. I'm just gonna make a nice big brush and make sure that, you know, even if it was subtle, now I'm in complete control. And I don't have to be perfect because the luminosity mask has done a lot of the work for me. Okay, so this is really grayscale, and you'll notice it's not hitting the sky, it's hitting where that water is. And if we turn that off, I can simply toggle this entire filter on and off, and you'll notice that the water spray gets nice and sharp. 
but it doesn't really blow up the rest of my image. And since I did this on an adjustment layer, I could even add additional filters here to control this. So maybe it is a little bit too bright. Maybe I want to go ahead and add a tone filter, and I'm going to use that smart toning again, but because I've created the mask already on the layer, when I move the smart toning to the left, it's really only affecting the luminance of that spray. And I'm starting to get some really cool detail there. And just to push it a little further and use one of the filters that we've discovered earlier on in the webinar, I'll add some small detail to that. And you can see right here that this is my before picture. Let me turn off my mask, always good policy. This was what I brought in, which is like, yeah, that's an okay picture. But if I show this to somebody, you know, it makes a huge difference. And then one thing I like to do, and I could have done this at the, I, now, and this is kind of a, uh, I, I want to tell you about this because it, it's a get you if you don't think about it, is I always like to throw in the Accent AI filter at the end of processing and see what it can do. But if I threw it in at the end of this list here on this adjustment layer, it would only affect my ocean spray. So I'm going to go ahead and add one more adjustment layer, throw on the Accent AI, may or may not help. I'm just kind of checking it out. It does. It opens up that left side a little bit, and I'm getting it to an area that I really like. So that's two ways that you can work with luminance. One is with the HSL, and the other is knowing how to use that filter, the luminosity filter, to your best advantage. And I'll open it up for another question. Uh, Great. Explain. Yeah, good explanation. Thank you for that. Okay, so there is a question about saving a Luminar look. Uh, how do you find it and what folder does it go into? Great question. And I'm going to jump back to one of the images that I worked on. And here's, you know, I love throwing as many tips out as possible. Let's pretend, and we don't have to pretend too hard, uh, I don't remember which image I worked on that has some changes. Because let's pretend there's a thousand images here. One of the things I can do with libraries is instead of looking at all photos, I can say, show me the ones that I've edited. And this will just jump me back to the, uh, the ones that I worked on in this webinar. So let's say I want to save one of the looks uh, that I created here. And we're going to go ahead and switch back to the edit mode. Uh, that wonderful adjustment layer that I then painted two extra lines on, we're going to turn off. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn off uh, all of them for now. So now I can see what each one looks like. So there's my original lighthouse. And perhaps I want to save this look here uh, of this adjustment layer. OK, so I selected the layer. I need to make sure it's turned on so there's no line through the little eyeball. And I like this look. I might want to apply this to other images I shot that day. So when you save a look, it saves everything inside of one adjustment layer. So if I wanted to do the black and white and this one, I would save them as separate looks and then apply them on separate layers on the next image. Or I could, if I wanted to, add a black and white filter at the bottom of this one, and I'm going to add it and then take it away, because as you can see, it will affect the style of the image. OK, if I wanted to save something with a slightly black and white look, but we're going to delete that. So I want to save all of these filters with the exact adjustments that I used. So I'll go down to the right hand corner and I'll click on Save Luminar Look. And then I can go ahead and give it a name. And I'm going to make this called uh, uh, Stormy Lighthouse. Not that I'll always have to use it on a lighthouse, but it's the way I can remember it. And I hit save. It immediately puts it inside my user looks folder and actually launches that folder, that, that looks collection. Okay, so there it is, Stormy Lighthouse. And here's some other ones that I had created. But let me show you where you would find that if you opened up Luminar on another day and you're not sure where that would be. At the very bottom of your Luminar looks collection, and I'm going to just scroll down, is your user Luminar looks. So if I was in another looks, if I went to one of these black and white ones and I wanted to find the one that I created, I need to just click on user Luminar looks and then there's all of mine. 
Now, here's another thing that uh, I'm throwing out tips like right and left that I haven't thrown out before. So it's a, it's a lucky webinar group. Uh, let's say I really like this. I can make it a favorite. I click on the little star. But you know something? I really like this look in Tonality Vintage that uh, is a really cool kind of look here called Memories. I'm going to give that one a little star. Well, in my Looks collection, there is an option for Favorites. And if I click on that, all the ones that I gave little stars to are right there. So a lot of times I will mix and match things that are existing looks that I've uh, installed directly from the Skylum library, as well as my own. And I can just quickly get to all of those by creating favorites and, and opening up my favorites collection. So that's the first half of the answer to the question, which is how to create them and where they live inside of Luminar. Now, where do they live inside your computer? You don't have to hunt. Whether you're on a Mac or a PC, all you have to do is simply go file, uh, I believe it's file on both the Mac and the PC, and there is show Luminar looks folder. And if I click on that, it will reveal, and I, I believe my screen should have changed, uh, all the ones that I created. And if I wanted to, I could step up a level and that will show me where all the looks are that I have installed. And these are looks that I installed that were either uh, installed directly when I uh, installed the program. And then Lori will show you at the end of the webinar where you can get some of these other great looks. And actually, I think all the looks I have installed here are free. And you can create some great, great um, images from these looks. And I do want to point out one more thing. I need to switch back to... Luminar. So let me go ahead and hit uh, Command Tab, and I have to bring that window forward. So let's say you downloaded a look that you really liked, or you even started off with one of our looks that you really like. So I'm going to jump over to, say, uh, Dramatic. Okay. And I'm going to apply this because I don't want to mess up my other ones. Brand new layer. Make sure all the other layers are turned off. Doesn't matter. And I'm going to apply this creative look right here. Okay, that's a creative look that came with the application. I love it, but you know something? It's too yellow for my taste. So I'm going to grab Photo Filter, which is probably what's making it yellow. And uh, as you see, I can make it more or less. Maybe I want to give it a little bit of a different color tone or just a lot less. But I've modified this existing filter. Well, now it's my filter the way I like it. And I can save that as my own look. And that's really, really nice. So I can say, you know something, this look is creative and it's ABBA, okay? Because I've done that and I can hit save. And you'll notice once again, it jumps over and shows me all of my user looks. As a matter of fact, there is Stormy Lighthouse, but I have creative ABBA and I can use that on any image. And this is something else you can do with looks. I can go ahead and say, you know, I liked it, but I was a little bit too aggressive in changing the, that filter. I really did want it to have a little more saturation and I want the hue to be a little bit different. So now I've modified this look. Maybe I want maybe a pinkish look to it. Well, what I can do is I've changed this and I wanna save that as my real creative version of ABBA. So I'm gonna right click on it and there's an option to update this look with the modifications that I made to it so that I don't have to recreate a new one and delete the old one. And by the way, there, if you needed to, you can delete any looks if you created it and you don't want to use it anymore. You can rename it if you named it poorly. And you can also export this. And the nice thing is I can export this look. I could email it to somebody. They open up their looks folder and drop it in. And now they have the exact same look that I created that they can use. So it's really very powerful. But I'm going to just update the settings. And now you'll notice it's giving me a warning that this is going to modify that look that I changed. I understand that. It's OK. I like the pink sky and the pink reflection on the building. And I'm good to go. So there is a little bit more about where looks are stored and even how you can enhance and modify them. Hey, Alba, we got a question from Nick. He was asking, if you crop an image and you save a look and then you apply that look to another image, does that crop get applied? 
The crop does not get applied. So the crops okay. are not saved. And that's, that's a great question. Um, and the nice thing about crops in general is they are non-destructive. As a matter of fact, everything is non-destructive. So if I went here and I said, oh, I want to crop this and I'm going to click on this lock key so I can really control the crop aesthetically. I want to you know, go with those rule of thirds there and I can go ahead and do that. It only affects this one image. And then if I changed my mind, all I have to do is go back to the crop tool. And even though I took off sections, I can go back and I can expand that crop one more time. So crops don't get saved, but one thing that does get saved is if I painted in a mask on one of these filters and I saved it as a look, that mask is saved. So I do recommend that if you created something and you painted it in as a mask, uh, take the mask off so you can paint it in exactly where you want. Uh, an example is if you look at the lower left corner of my screen, I have a look that I personally created called Eye Enhance. And what it does is it sharpens and brightens eyes. So whenever I'm doing a portrait, and I don't know if I brought a portrait into this library, but let's take a quick peek. I don't want to look at just the edited ones. I'll go to all photos. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't bring one in, uh, but I could simply go ahead and and take that filter. I'll, I'll do it because sharpening will work on a variety of things. I'll go ahead and maybe sharpen the moon there. And so I would grab that eye enhance. Let's pretend that's the moon looking down at us. It's eye. I apply it. It applied it to the whole image, and then what I would do is I would, on that layer that I just created, and actually I would do this on a separate layer, so let me undo that, and like I proposed, always do those creative enhancements on adjustment layers. I would apply Eye Enhance, and it applies it, and now I would simply go grab the brush, and assuming this was an eyeball, or the man on the moon is looking down at us, I would simply paint that sharpening and brightening on the eye. So I've created, you know, things that I like to do where I've just sharpened, you know, eyes. Sometimes I'll work on skin. You can see my biggest friend is the erase key because I can't paint really well. Um, so that's why I do photography because I cannot draw a straight line. But I've been able to use my eye sharpening filter to sharpen the moon a little bit, brightens it up. So even though I created it for one purpose, I can still use it for another. So when creating any kind of a look, don't put any kind of a mask on it when you save it. Uh, use it globally and then paint it on exactly where you want it to happen. Hey, Alba, since you have a mask there, there was a question about how do you copy a mask from one layer to another? Can you show how you do that? Copying masks is, is very, very powerful. So uh, you can do it from layer to layer. You can also do it from filter to filter. So let me go ahead and add uh, another uh, layer here. I'm gonna do a color balance. So I'm gonna go ahead and simply uh, click on add a new layer. And maybe I, I do like the fact that this is a little blue, but I'm going to change this. I'm going to add a filter. I'm going to just go right to the develop filter because I know there's the option here to, to, to go ahead and change the temperature and exposure here. And so it's doing it to everything. Um, and it's kind of blowing out my moon, but it's changing you know, the whole tone and time of day. As a matter of fact, I could even go ahead because I want this to work because it didn't work last time. I want to force a, a golden hour. Eh, it's hard to turn the world blue, yellow when it's already blue, but it's really messing up my moon. Okay. This is nice. Moon's messed up. I created an adjustment layer. Uh, on this adjustment, I created a mask. So I can go ahead and you're thinking he's nuts, but there's method to my madness. I'm going to copy the mask I created for the moon, go back up to this adjustment layer, and I'm going to actually paste that mask that I've created. And you're like, wait a second, all he's done was screw up the moon. Well, I painted that mask intentionally because now if I invert the mask, okay, I'm using the same mask I created before. Now I'll probably need to do a little cleanup, but you'll notice that I'm inverted it and now I've used the same mask to brighten everything but the moon. 
and then I'll probably go ahead and erase because uh, I was kind of sloppy here on the on the edge. So that is one of the challenges. But you can easily copy and paste masks to do it. You just simply right click, go to the mask mode, go copy, and then you can paste it. So I could have pasted this on uh, the other way, but now I kind of inverted it. And I like to do that sometimes when I want to maybe brighten one area and then darken the rest. It gives me a lot of flexibility. So copy and ma pasting masks are very, very powerful. You don't have to keep repeating uh, the painting. You just take what you've done and reuse it. Great. Hey, Alba. Yes. Uh, looks like we're at the top of the hour. Um, so what I'd like to do is show folks where they can find more information, if that's okay. Can I, I, I want to try one more trick if people are sure. patient. And that's okay. uh, a lot of times people want to add clouds to an image. Uh, so here's an image that definitely needs some work. It was a little overblown, and I'm going to go back. Quick and awesome. Real big fan of it. I can kind of bring in some sky. I can kind of process this a little bit. But I kind of wanted a little more clouds in this image, and it wasn't a very cloudy day. So I just can point in, instead of adding an adjustment layer, I can actually add another image on top of this. This is great for textures and whatnot. But I'm going to go ahead and bring in just uh, uh, some clouds. These are some sky images. Uh, that we have, and I can pick, you know, do I want it to be evil clouds or good clouds? Uh, let's go with uh, just a little more clouds. I think that's what I want. And I'm going to open that up, and that gets placed on top of this image. And now what I can do is I can start blending this together. So I can go in here and I can say, you know what, I'm going to go with a gradient mask. And it's basically the same thing as if I brushed it in, and I'm going to just go ahead and make a little bit of a mask here, bring it up a little bit and start this and you'll see, and I'm gonna even let the clouds go a little bit on top of this. So now I have these great new clouds. I'll turn this off for just a second and I could get away with it like this. This is actually kind of pretty nice. Um, but if I needed to, and it was a little too obvious that I blended those in, I could right click and go sometimes to a blending mode and overlay sometimes makes things a little bit more gentle and screen, but I kind of like it the way it is. And if I really was picky and I was concerned that I have clouds in front of here, after I've done the gradient mask, I can switch over to a brush and I'm gonna turn on the overlay. And all I have to do is shrink my brush down or zoom in on my image and just erase uh, those areas where I don't want my clouds. And because it is so gentle, I really don't have to be as picky but you can see very easily, I can now change this image to where I didn't have much clouds and now I have great clouds and I could probably even throw on the accent day if I felt here for clouds, uh, sky enhancer. And let's see if that, and even bring it out a little bit more. So there we go. It was a great day that I've turned to a beautiful blue skies. And with that, Lori, I will hand it back uh, to you to, to show them exactly where they can find some more information. Great. Hey, that was a great demonstration with the clouds. I love using that gradient tool. That's so easy to add stuff. So that's great. Okay. All right, folks. So let's see here. Can you see my screen, everyone? Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, go ahead and say, okay, yes, yes. so far. I Perfect. Can... Okay. So if you go to skylum.com, and I'll just go ahead and just go to the regular main site here. You'll see that we've got many different products along the top, but since we're talking about Luminar today, if you just hover over Luminar, uh, you'll see that there's some interesting information over here on the left. It's kind of more marketing type related things. And then on the right is our education. So one of the things I do want to point out to you is we do have a roadmap for Luminar. This is some of the plans that are coming up next uh, in development uh, throughout the rest of the year, and they'll be adding some more things in here as well. So if you're curious on the Mac, Windows, or the cloud, uh, you can take a look at that roadmap there. Now, what I really want to do is focus on a couple of things here. One is the marketplace. Now, Abba was showing you some really neat features that he had, some looks uh, that you can download. We even have, we haven't gone over LUTs, but we have LUTs and overlays and workspaces and textures in here. So if you go to the marketplace, you'll get some looks, for instance, that you can pay for, but we also have freebies under looks, some paid and free ones. Now, the one I really highly recommend that you download, in fact, 
I insist to anyone who's interested in black and white to go ahead and download this pack here. It's from Rich Harrington. It's a Tonality Mega Black and White Pack. Love this. Um, this has a ton of black and white conversions in here uh, for the looks that you can add to your images. And uh, it's all free. So definitely check that out. The other thing too is under education, we do post, uh, gosh, probably a couple of videos and a webinar each week. Uh, we've got articles and such. So if you go under uh, education, we do have it kind of broken up into different categories. A few people here asked about this webinar, if it's going to be available to view, and it will be. We'll have it posted under webinars, uh, and you'll see it under past events. It'll probably be towards the bottom uh, once we get that posted. So you can view some of our past webinars here. We always try to record those so that you can uh, review or see ones that you might have missed. Okay, let's see here. One more thing. Um, the user guide is also a really great asset. If you have any questions about Luminar, you can always uh, email our support, support at skylum.com. We've got a great team there that can help you out with any technical issues. But if you're curious about, oh, you know, what does a particular filter do? Go to the using filter section. And these are categorized by the different categories. So if you're interested in some of those creative filters uh, that some of them that Abba was showing, you can go ahead and take a look in here. And it actually talks about each of the different sliders and what they do. So that's a really handy feature there. Okay, besides that, we do have a YouTube channel. If you go to Skylum Software, we've got tons of videos on here that you can take a look at marketing videos, educational videos, all kinds of things, including some contests that we run. So you may want to check that out as well. Okay, with that, uh, I want to thank everyone again for joining us today. Abba, thank you for all those extra tips. You got a lot of kudos today on sharing some very uh, different things that haven't been shared before. So we really appreciate you folks My pleasure. joining us today. Okay, yes. and with thank, that, we'll thank you everybody. the rest of your day. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>